with me in your Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. We've been talking about grace on Sunday mornings. Um, and at this point, we've been talking about the uh, empowering side of grace. The fact that one of the aspects of God's grace, one of the reasons that he gives it to us, is to empower us for service. Amen. Have you ever found something that you saw in the Bible that you were supposed to do or something you knew you were supposed to do for God, but you didn't feel like you had the ability or the desire to do it? Like the prison? <laughs> Amen. Well, God's grace is there for you. Amen. God's grace is there to empower you to do it. As a matter of fact, God never expected us. He never expected us to do his will in the arm of the flesh, in just what you can do. He, he gave the grace of God to empower you for service. As a matter of fact, if you'll remember in the book of Acts, everybody loves to, to quote the Great Commission, you know, where Jesus told the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You remember that? Well, then in the book of Acts, he, when, it follows it up and gives a little more clarification on what he actually said. He told them to go into all the world, but then he said, but wait, don't go yet, wait until you are endued with power from on high. Talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power. Amen. Praise God. So he gives power for service. Power to be a witness. Power to do the will of God. I'll tell you what, if you're going through this Christian life and you're doing it all in your own strength, I feel sorry for you. Because it can be miserable trying to live holy, trying to do the will of God, trying to go to church, trying to be a good Christian in your own strength. I tell you what, that's not easy. But amen, there's a grace to empower you for it. Amen. And that's what we've been talking about is the empowering grace of God. And last week we started a, a kind of a mini series within the sermon called Three Ways to Get More Grace. And I only got into one last week and I'm going to get into another one this morning. Last week we talked about one of the ways... To receive the grace of God uh, or to get more grace in your life is through humility. And now, humility, we're not, I'm not going to re-preach the sermon, so I'll just tell you that our, our website has all of our sermons on it. You can listen to all of them for free. If you missed last week, please go get it, catch up. Uh, but it's one of the ways you can get more grace is through humility. And humility is not probably what you think it is. It's not just being quiet or shy uh, if that was the case, Jesus was not very humble and certainly neither was Paul or many of the apostles because most of them were not quiet and they were not shy. Now it can take that form because occasionally when you are walking in humility, it means that you be quiet. You know when to be quiet. You don't always have to be the center of attention. But ultimately, the true biblical definition of humility is being submitted to the will of God and being submitted to His Word. That's really what humility is, is you humble your life, your thoughts, uh, your mouth, everything about your life, you humble it and submit it under the Word of God. And he says when you do that, that God will give you more grace. How many of you could use more grace? <laughs> he said he opposes the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. So effectively, the more you walk in humility, the more grace you're going to have upon your life. Glory to God. So that's the first way that you can get more grace. Again, if you missed it, I, I encourage you to, to get online and listen to the sermon. But I want to give you another way that you can get more grace this morning. And that way is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Let's read it. He says, "...and those who belong to Christ..." have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Amen. Everybody say with me this morning, walk by the Spirit. Glory to God. What he's saying here is he's saying that because you're saved, you're living in the Spirit. Your life is now in the Spirit. But what he's saying is let your actions follow the fact that you have life in the Spirit, now you've actually got to walk in the Spirit. And I think some people probably look at that and go, well, man, if I'm living in the Spirit, shouldn't I just naturally walk in the Spirit? All you have to do is look at your life and lives around you and lives in the church and realize real quick that no, every Christian does not always walk in the Spirit. Amen. 
I imagine we could all probably even look back just to yesterday and find out some points in our life yesterday where we were not walking by the Spirit, that we were probably walking by the flesh. You know, every opportunity you face, every encounter with a co-worker, every encounter with a person, every encounter with somebody cutting you off in traffic, you have an opportunity to either walk by the flesh or walk by the Spirit, to speak by the flesh or to speak by the Spirit, to respond out of the flesh or to respond out of the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. If you are not intentional about responding out of the Spirit, you absolutely will respond by the flesh because your default response is a fleshly response for most people. Most people's default response is not a response from the Spirit. It's a fleshly response. Amen. And that's why in Galatians, he tells us there's a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. Flesh wants to do what it wants. Spirit wants to do what God wants. That battle is always going on and you never get over it. But I'm going to tell you, most people don't even think like this when they walk through their day. They don't even think, I ought to be walking in the spirit today. They just live out of the flesh. And I'm going to tell you, when you do that, you stifle the grace of God in your life. The grace of God is most active and most effective when you are living in the Spirit. And that's why Paul tells them here, he's, actually if you keep on reading, this is right where he talks about, uh, in, in Galatians, right where he talks about that battle that's going on between the flesh and the Spirit. Some people don't understand that if they're supposed to be saved, how they could possibly be tempted for all these horrible sins or they could still have these thoughts that are impure and unholy. It's like, I thought I was saved. What am I doing still having thoughts like that? Well, you're saved. You have life in the Spirit, but you still have a flesh. Amen. You still have a flesh that tempts you and wants to do wrong, and until you're dead, you're going to have that old thing to deal with. But you can overcome it by living in the Spirit and by making choices out of the Spirit. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. To set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Glory to God. Let me read that one more time. I want you to just, you can turn there if you want, Romans 8, 5. Maybe you've already turned there. Let your eyes rest upon it. Let this get in your spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the spirit. Are you getting what he's saying here that this is an intentional act of your will? He says, set your mind upon it. Have you ever set your mind upon something? Focused your mind upon it? Set your mind upon it? That's what he's talking about here. He has set your mind. It's an intentional process of thinking in the Spirit and in line with God's Word. I'm going to give you an example. If you're driving down the road and you just happen to have on, you know, Fox News or talk radio or something like that, and you're listening to all the things that's going on in the political world, or, or you're listening to all the things that are going on about the economy and the doom and gloom and all the bad things that are coming against our nation, and you listen to all that for very long, all that is is flesh talking. That's all it is. Now, I'm not saying I'm against any of those things. I, I listen to them occasionally myself. That's not the point. But you've got to understand, uh, most of those people that are speaking over the radio are not talking out of the Spirit. They're talking out of the flesh. That's all they're doing. They're not talking by the Spirit of God. They're talking by the flesh. And what that looks like is, I'm in the world. I'm observing the world. What I can see in the natural. What I can see taking place in the natural. And I'm going to just talk about it. But how many know there's a whole other realm than just the natural? That those news anchors can't see. If they're not Christians and they're not praying. Any, any fool, if you want to say it that way, any fool can look at what's going on around him and say, oh yeah, this is what's happening in the world. This is what's happening in the, in, in the nation. It takes a spiritual person to see beyond that and say, yeah, that might be what's happening in the natural, but God is at work. Amen. There are things going on that's unseen that we cannot see that when you live in the Spirit, you get insight about. And I'm not looking to partner my voice with the voice of the world or a fleshly voice. I'm looking to partner my voice with the voice of the Spirit and what God is saying. Amen. You know, that's why there's all this talk 
you know, in, in, in recent years about the planet having trouble and, you know, that's why we're focusing so much on green and, you know, going green and all this stuff. But, you know, again, that's just something you look at from the natural. But how many of you know when you look from the spiritual angle and you see what the Lord says about the earth, this planet's not going anywhere until he's ready. Now, they might be right in some degree because it is going to go up in flames at some point. <laughs> but it's not until he's ready. It's, it's not like God's going, well, I better, I better speed up the rapture a little bit and get my people out of there because the, the planet's about to catch on fire. I mean, it's all according to his timetable. But I want to I caution you this morning. If you're going to walk in the grace of God, you've got to have a different voice in your life than just the voice of the flesh. If you're always listening to people talking by the flesh, giving their counsel by the flesh, giving their advice by the flesh, and it's never by the Spirit, you're not going to be able to walk in the Spirit. You're just going to walk in the flesh. That's why uh, David said in the Psalms, he said, Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Why? Because it's fleshly counsel. And all it's going to do is keep you in the flesh. But how many of you know that there is spiritual counsel? Somebody speaking in your life that's speaking by the voice of the Spirit. Speaking from a place of, of spirit. I'll tell you this. I realized a long time ago that if I was going to walk by faith, that I had to cut off certain voices in my life. If I was going to walk by faith and do what God told me to do, I was going to have to cut off certain voices in my life. Certain voices that any time that they speak, all they speak of is by the flesh. Because I'm telling you, when you're trying to walk by faith, you're trying to step out in faith, do something of faith for God, you already know all the reasons you can't do it. You already know all the reasons that it's impossible. You don't need somebody coming to you, well, I don't know, have you thought about this? Can you, you sure about this? Now, can you do this? You know, this person tried to do it and they failed. It didn't work out for them. I know all of that. All you're doing is partnering with the flesh and worse, you're partnering with the devil because that's the same thing he's telling me. <laughs> he's telling me, you can't do that. You can't be obedient to God in that. Oh, but that's the voice of the flesh. But what is the voice of the Spirit saying? What is the voice of your spirit? What is the voice of the Holy Spirit through your spirit saying to you? That's why I love to talk to spiritual people. I love to talk to people that are in the spirit. They live their life in prayer. They're spiritual people. You can tell when someone is not a prayer. They do not spend time in prayer because many of the things that come out of their mouth are fleshly. The advice is fleshly. The counsel is fleshly. They've not been in the spirit or else spiritual words would be coming out of their mouth. You know, when you spend time praying in the spirit, you begin to hear the voice of heaven. You begin to get an understanding of heaven's agenda. Let me, let me give you an example. Over our city, okay? Now, I've lived in different cities than Alexandria. I've lived in Tulsa for, for a few years. Lived in Shreveport for a few years. And naturally speaking, Alexandria, it's not as nice as some of the other cities that I live in, you know. Uh, just from a natural standpoint, streets, roads, service, customer service, etc. But again, who can't observe that and see that? I mean, it doesn't take five seconds to realize that and look at your city. That's why I've, the more I pray for my city, the more I believe God for my city, the less I can tolerate someone speaking that fleshly input about my city. Because that's not what I see for my city. That's not what I hear for my city. So I, I get tired, you know, it's, it can be frustrating, it can be tiresome hearing people speak by the flesh all the time about their city. Well, this, I don't like this and this about, oh, when I lived back this way, this city was like that, but we don't have that. In it just grieves me because I say, yeah, but that's not what I'm believing for my city, and that's not what the voice of heaven is saying about my city. And all you really do when you, all you're really doing when you begin to talk like that, all you're really doing is that you're revealing that you're not praying for your city. That's what you're doing because the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's just one example, but I could give multiple when you're try we're trying to do something in the church or, you know, I could go on and on and on and people begin to speak. They begin to say their thoughts on it. They begin to say their opinions on it. And it doesn't take just a few minutes. You can tell whether someone is a prayer or not, whether they're living a life of the Spirit or not because their words will line up with what the Spirit is saying about the church. Their words will, will, will line up with what the Spirit is saying about this endeavor that we're trying to do. You can always tell because if not, their words will just line up with the flesh. I've, I've been having conversations with people before. And as they're talking, in my mind, I'm thinking, you, you are so out of tune. 
You are so out of tune with what the Spirit of God is saying on this issue. It could be a national issue. It could be an issue about that our nation is face, uh, facing about, about homosexuality. Or it could be an issue that our, our nation is facing on politics. And people begin to talk, talk, talk about it. And I'll tell you, if you're a spiritual person and you spend time in the Spirit hearing the voice of heaven, you can recognize right away, you, you are so out of tune on this, on this issue. You're not in tune with what the Spirit of God is saying about it. Amen. Look with me in John chapter 6. Or actually, just listen, I'm going to read it rather than... Because we're going to go through a lot of scripture this morning. John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said this. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Glory to God. Let me read that again. He said, it is the Spirit who gives life, but the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Let me tell you something. When your words, when you are a spiritual person and you're in prayer, your words will begin to line up with the words of Jesus. And so when you speak, your words will give life. Your words will bring life into a situation. Your words will bring life into the person that you're talking to. Your words will bring encouragement to the person that you're talking to. But when you're speaking by the flesh, it does just the opposite. If the Spirit gives life, then the flesh brings death, just like Romans said. So when you speak by the flesh, you're not bringing life into that person. You're not bringing life into them. When you just speak by the flesh, all you're doing is you're bringing discouragement. And many times, without knowing it, you're actually partnering with what the enemy is saying. You've got to be careful about that. You want to give me, I'll give you an example. Jesus was trying to talk to his disciples about the fact that he was about to be crucified. And Peter rebuked him. Peter turned to Jesus and he said, Not so, Lord. This will not happen for you. Now, from the natural, that seemed like a good thing to say, I guess, in Peter's mind. But how many of you know he was not speaking by the Spirit? He was speaking by the flesh. And so Jesus looked at him and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Why could he say that? Because Peter was saying the same words that Satan was saying. Jesus was already struggling with going to the cross. You say, how do you know that? Because when you look in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying drops of blood, saying, Father, if this is your will, let it pass before me. He already had the enemy working on him. He already had his flesh working on him, saying, this is going to be hard. You don't want to do this. This is going to be difficult. The last thing he needed was Peter to speak and team up his words with the same thing that his flesh and the devil was already telling him. But Peter, Peter spoke up, no, you don't have to do that. That's not going to happen with you. And by the Spirit, Jesus looked at him and he said, Satan, get thee behind me. Because Peter was teaming up his words and saying the same thing that the devil in his flesh was saying. And I'm telling you that the body of Christ has got to grow up to the point where we're, we, we stop living and operating out of the flesh. Our words ought to be spiritual words. Our words ought to be life-giving they ought to encourage people, bring life into their life, life into a situation, even over your city. I tell you, I, and I've been guilty of it myself too, don't get me wrong. I've been guilty of, of complaining about things in my city. But I'm going to tell you, I want our words to change on this. I want our words to begin to speak life over our city, life over our businesses, life over Walmart, glory to God. <laughs> Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 27, And he came in the Spirit into the temple. How did he come into the temple? In the Spirit. So, what does that mean? I mean, that's, that's Scripture, and obviously he, that's there for a reason. It says, when he came into the temple, he came in a particular way. He came in the Spirit. What would our church services look like if when people came to church, they came in the Spirit? You don't have to answer. Just think about it. Let that set in for just a minute. That, this is one of the reasons I firmly believe 
that the enemy has a Sunday morning agenda for families. He has a Sunday morning agenda to get people in the flesh before or on their way to church. You know what I'm talking about. Happens in my house too. It's not just yours. There's something with the kids. You're making breakfast and spill this thing on the floor. You can't you're having a bad hair day. Can't pick out your can't pick out your clothes. On the way to work, there's an argument in the car. And I mean people come into church so in the flesh, so full of the flesh. That's why it takes two songs, an offering message, and another three worship songs before we ever get the spirit moving in here. You wonder why we take so long in worship. We gotta get people in the spirit. <laughs> But it's true. I believe the enemy has a Sunday morning agenda. But look at how Simeon came. It says, and he came, how? In the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms, blessed God, and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to all your people. Amen. I'm telling you right now, if Simeon had come into that temple in the flesh, he would not have recognized that baby as the Messiah. He never would have recognized it. If he had come into that temple any other way than in the Spirit, this passage of Scripture would not be here. He would have missed the thing that he'd been waiting his life for, he came into the temple in the spirit and he was spiritually perceptive enough to look at an infant and realize that it was the Messiah. Now you can't do that. You can't look at a, a baby. They, all babies look the same just about it. You can't look at a baby and, and recognize something specific on their life. How? Unless you're in the spirit. But he was in the spirit. He was in tune with the spirit. And when that baby walked in the temple, the spirit of God spoke to him and he knew that was the Messiah. And he delivered a prophecy about the Messiah that is significant for all of us to know. Amen. Turn to Revelations chapter 1, verse 9. Revelations chapter 1, verse 9. Now, John, the Apostle John, received the book of Revelation when he was exiled to an island called Patmos, which, you know, Patmos was basically just a big rock. If you look at it today, it's still there. If you look at it today, it's very little vegetation, very little uh, trees or anything like that. It's just very rocky, very barren. And actually, the Roman government would use Patmos as a, as a place to exile prisoners. They had a mine there, and so they would exile prisoners there to work the mines. Very harsh. It's, it's right in the middle of the sea. It has no, because there's no trees or anything, it has extreme uh, vulnerability to the wind. And it's just very harsh, very barren, very dry. Not a pleasant place to be. And so they would exile prisoners there. And they did the same thing with John. He, he exiled John there. Now, the way that John got there, if you go read the history, uh, first, uh, first the, the emperor tried to boil him in oil. And when he, he boiled him in oil, and it was like the three Hebrew children, it didn't even hurt him, didn't even touch him. So instead, he exiled him to this island. Now, you know how old John is at this point? He's over 90 years old. Most of us ain't even alive at 90. And he's at 90, just been boiled in oil, <laughs> exiled to the island of Patmos, and he's living in a cave. As a matter of fact, they have identified the cave that they believe he was in because of the writings that are in the cave. He's 90 years old living on a, in a cave. Now, I doubt they sent him with a mattress and a lantern or anything like that. So the man is 90 years old living in a cave. You ever saw that movie with uh, Tom Hanks? What's it called? Castaway. It's probably like John. <laughs> just on the island over there, there might be some straggler prisoners working in the mine. But he's just in the cave. In verse 9, it says, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Verse 10, And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches of Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And so he, Jesus gives him the seven churches, the seven letters to the churches we have in Revelation, and the entire book of Revelation about what the end times are going to be like. And how did he receive that revelation? 
He's 90 years old, living in a cave, and yet he's in the Spirit. Now, how many of you know it's hard enough to get in the Spirit when you have a nice house and you have a nice car and you've got plenty of money and there's plenty of food in your belly and everything's going right and you live in America. He's 90 years old, living in a cave, and on the Lord's Day, he's in the Spirit. He's not in a cave moping about his situation. He's not in a cave mad at God of his situation. He's not in the cave talking about how he can't understand why this would happen to such a faithful person of the gospel. He's in the Spirit. If he were doing any of those things, he wouldn't have been in the Spirit. He would have been in the flesh. Because I can tell you that's what his flesh was saying. His flesh was saying, you don't deserve this, John. This is not what you're... A, you're an apostle of the faith, one of the twelve. You ought to be back there teaching the churches and enjoying your pastorship. That's what his flesh was telling him, and I can guarantee the devil was on the side saying the same thing. But he was in the Spirit, and so he was not saying any of those things. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and because of it, he received the greatest revelation ever given. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I can tell you, that wasn't the first Lord's day that had passed. This was a habit that John had of being in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It was probably just like any other day, but he was in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ the Messiah appears behind him and gives him the greatest revelation ever given. Why? Because he was in the Spirit. In the Spirit. You don't typically get revelations from Jesus sitting around moping about your situation and complaining about your plight. There's a way to receive from heaven, but it requires you being in the Spirit. What about uh, Paul and Silas? I've read that so many times. If you read that story, they were beaten with rods. What a day they had. My goodness, go read the whole story. <laughs> the day they had, I mean, beaten with rods, thrown in prison, they're shackled up in prison, and it says at midnight. Now, how many of you know if you had a day like that, you'd be sleeping at midnight? I'm too tired to pray. I'm too tired to worship. I guess I'll just get up early in the morning and do it. I can't pray right now. I guarantee you one of them was saying that. <laughs> the other one elbowed him. Paul said, Silas, quit all that griping and moaning. No, I'm just kidding. They may have both been in the Spirit. I don't know. But it says at midnight, they began to sing praises to God. Why did they do that? <clears throat> I believe one of the reasons they started doing that was to try to get into the Spirit. See, many times when you're in a situation like that, most of us don't have situations like that, but you're in a situation, you've got to do things to stir yourself up to get into the Spirit. How do you think they got into the Spirit? By singing those hymns. That's how they got into the Spirit. Matter of fact, let's look at the verse in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all of your heart. So he specifically gives singing unto the Lord as one way to be filled with the Spirit. So I, I can tell you that's what Paul and Silas were doing. They were not singing because they felt like singing. Okay, let's get that... Let's make sure we're clear on that. They were not singing because they felt like singing. They were singing because they were choosing to get into the Spirit instead of wallowing in the flesh. So they were in a situation, they begin to sing, and how do you know they begin to be filled with the Spirit? And I can tell you that those, those songs begin to get louder and louder and louder till the other prisoners heard them, it says. And all of a sudden, God showed up on the scene. There's an earthquake. The whole thing breaks loose. The jailer gets saved and all of his family, all of them baptized. Why? Because they made a choice to get into the Spirit, which is where the grace was. And it produced phenomenal results that could have never been produced in the flesh. But that's what happens when you get in the Spirit. He says, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all of your heart. I believe the reason he mentions wine right here is because that is the fleshly way to deal with pressure. He says he's, he's contrasting being drunk with wine as opposed to being filled with the Spirit. 
Why? Because wine is a fleshly response to pressure. It's a fleshly response to the pressures of life. It's a fleshly response to situations, trials, trouble that you find yourself in. How many of you know that many people are, are, are bound by alcohol because if they had found themselves in the situation that Paul and Silas was in, or John, instead of turning to the Spirit, they'd have turned to the bottle. Amen. Why? Because you can, to a measure. You can, you know, drink away your sorrow and your, your problems and be a stress reliever for you for a season, but how many know it has severe consequences in the long run? It's, it's a deceiver. But he says here, that, don't, don't deal with life that way. That's a fleshly way of dealing with it. And he could have said anything here. You know, he said wine, but he could have said anything. He just said, don't turn into a couch potato when you're dealing with the struggles of life and grab your favorite bag of potato chips and sit on the couch and just, you know, waste your day. That's just a fleshly way. Or some people grab those big cans of icing and a spoon, you know, start eating icing out of the thing. You know, that's, that's just a fleshly way to deal with life. But how many of you know there is a more excellent way and a more biblical way to deal with life and it's by being filled with the Spirit? Praise God. And that's what he's saying here. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't turn to some fleshly way of, of dealing with life and finding your encouragement and finding your strength. It says, don't deal with it that way. Be filled with with the Spirit, singing to yourselves and one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all of your heart. Now, let me ask you, have any of you ever done this? Have you ever practiced this? Glory to God. I mean, it's like, it's like a miracle worker. If you're going through a, a bad, you're having a bad day, or you're dealing with a big situation, your mind is overloaded, your emotions are overloaded, and instead of griping and moaning about it, you begin to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Your flesh will not feel like it. But if you choose to do it, how many of you know that all of a sudden the peace of God that passes understanding begins to come? Your spirit begins to rise. Strength begins to come. Grace begins to come. Power begins to come. Amen. And before you know it, you are in the spirit. And that is where miracles happen. Miracles do not happen living in the flesh. Miracles happen when you get in the Spirit. We can see that in the life of Paul and Silas. We can see it in the life of Simeon. We can see it in the life of Jesus. We can see it in the life of John the Baptist. Look at Jesus. Okay? We, we talked about this on a few Wednesday nights ago. Jesus was in the garden. He's struggling with his will. We don't have time to get into it, but he clearly said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Except not my will, your will be done. So he was struggling with his will and God's will, submitting his will to God's will. But if you look at the story in Luke, he says, not my will, but your will be done. So he submitted to it. He was dealing with those pressures in the spirit, dealing with them through prayer. Then it says, an angel appeared to him and strengthened him. See, miracles happen in the spirit. How many of you believe that angels still appear today to bring strength to believers? Amen. You may not see them the way Jesus saw them, but it doesn't matter whether you see them or not. There's something going on in the, in the spirit realm when you begin to pray and you choose to deal with something in the spirit as opposed to dealing with it in the flesh. Now, there are people in this room right now that you are, you are facing, uh, you're facing situations. You know, some of you in your marriage, some of you in your business, and you might have been dealing with it by the flesh. You might have been, you know, all flesh in how you're handling it. But I'm telling you, there's a better way. There's a better way that will result in peace, and it will result in joy, and it will result in miracles taking place. It will result in a grace of God coming on your life like you've not experienced before. And I'm telling you, I need grace. The more I do for God, the more grace that I need. Because the more I do for God, the more I realize that I'm, how incapable I really am. I need His grace. Amen. Praise God. So he says here in Ephesians 5, Do not be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the, heart, uh, to the Lord with all of your heart. I mean, there's just so much here. One of the things, in other, one of the ways he says we can be filled with the Spirit is by ministering to other people. 
He says addressing one another and bringing encouragement into someone else's life. Instead of focusing on your situation, you can actually bring ministry and encouragement into someone else's life and that will be a way to receive the Spirit of God in your life. That's what he's saying here. It's one of the ways to be filled with the Spirit. Glory to God. When you are in the Spirit, it affects every area of your life. When you are in the Spirit, it affects your love walk. You know, we're instructed in the New Testament, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is, what it looks like. You ever read that chapter and thought, my goodness, I can't do that. Love is patient, love is kind, love is long-suffering, does not look out for its own interests. Amen. But when you're in the Spirit, it affects your love walk. It affects the way that you treat people. When you're in the Spirit, it affects your speech, as we talked about earlier. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, it says, Everyone enjoys a fitting reply. It is wonderful to say the right thing at the right time. Glory to God. That's a New Living Translation. When you're in the Spirit, it affects your attitude. It's hard to be depressed or maybe impossible to be depressed and in the Spirit. You can't be frustrated and in the Spirit. If you're frustrated, it's an indication, an indication that you're not walking in the grace of God and that you're not walking in the Spirit. Frustration is like a little red check engine light going off on your dashboard saying, hey, there's a problem here. There's a problem. If you're walking in frustration, then you're not walking in peace. If you're walking in frustration, then you're not walking in His grace. So when you begin to feel yourself frustrated at a person, frustrated over a situation, that's one of the ways you can know, I'm handling this by the flesh. I've, I've gone the wrong way on this. And I believe, let's stand up together. I believe that as the times grow darker and... The days get darker as we get closer to the end times. I believe this ability to be able to live by the Spirit of God and live in the Spirit is going to be more important and it's going to be more uh, essential than it's ever been. Now what I want us to do, I want us to take just a few moments and let's pray and let's, let's do exactly what the Scripture said. Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Be filled with the Spirit, singing to yourself, singing to others in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let's just take a moment this morning and allow the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts. And if you've been living by the flesh, I want you to take this opportunity to make an adjustment. I want you to take this opportunity to allow your heart to be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen?